Hi, I'm Jesse Spanogle, host of the new podcast, The Hopeless Cause. How's your quarantine going? This week on The Hopeless Cause, we're going to go over our vision and mission, helping everybody stay connected during these times of trial. We're going to take a look at St. Patrick, a saint of perseverance and faith in God. We're going to look at the Gospel, John chapter 9, this Sunday's readings. And then we're going to finally look at how we can see with eyes of faith. After that, we're going to have some announcements and help everybody stay connected during these times. The Hopeless Cause is a weekly web series focused on proclaiming the gospel during difficult times. St. Jude is the patron saint of hopeless causes. I, Jesse Spanogle, I'm the youth minister for St. Jude the Apostle, St. Andrew, and St. Julia Parishes here in Erie, Pennsylvania. We want to help provide hope for the youth and help them stay connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The saint of the week is St. Patrick. St. Patrick is probably one of the most famous and popular saints of our time. He was taken at a young age, I think uh, 14, as a slave. He had a vision that he would be the voice of the Irish, which ultimately led him to the priesthood. Patrick went back to Ireland and converted many by preaching the gospel. He's uh, famously known for using the shamrock to help explain the Holy Trinity. Patrick was a man of deep devotion who trusted God in all that he did. He surrendered his will to God's will. Patrick teaches us the importance of accepting the mission God provides for us and finding our true vocation. St. Patrick, the Saint of the Week. St. Patrick was born, not in Ireland, but in Britain around AD 35. Well, actually, he wasn't called St. Patrick at the time, or even Patrick, but was referred to as Maywin Sukkot. Good thing he changed his name later. St. Maywin's Day just doesn't have the same ring. We'll stick with Patrick, uh, just in case I'm slaughtering that pronunciation. Patrick was quite far from being a saint growing up. Until he was 16, he considered himself a pagan, or maybe even an atheist by today's definition. It was at that age when he was taken into slavery by a group of Irish marauders that attacked his village. Patrick was sold to his master, a druid chief in Ireland, and served him for six years. It was during his captivity that he became a Christian. One day he heard what he described as a voice compelling him in his sleep to leave his master and find a ship that awaited him. He fled to the coast of Ireland and eventually made it back to his home. He then decided to study in the monastery and stayed there for 12 years, during which he decided that his calling was to convert the pagans to Christianity. Eventually, he adopted his Christian name, Patricius, or Patrick as we now know it, and returned to Ireland after being appointed a bishop. Patrick was very successful at winning converts, which upset the Celtic Druids, who had him arrested several times, but he managed to escape each arrest. Patrick traveled through Ireland, establishing monasteries, schools, and churches throughout the land. Eventually, Patrick returned to where he had once been a slave, to pay his ransom to his former master. Despite being treated cruelly, Patrick didn't hold a grudge against him. As Patrick approached his master's old homestead, to his horror, he saw that it was in flames. Patrick found out that the stories people told about him had preceded him, and in a fit of frenzy, his old master gathered all of his treasures into his mansion, set them on fire, and then threw himself into the flames. An ancient record adds that his pride could not endure the thought of being vanquished by his former slave. There are a lot of legends surrounding St. Patrick. Some say that he raised people from the dead. Others say that he drove snakes out of Ireland, but since there aren't any fossil records of snakes in Ireland at that time, it's highly unlikely, unless he drove out the fossils as well. Many think that snakes was a metaphor for the conversion of the pagans, meaning that he drove paganism out from Ireland. Green wasn't the original color associated with St. Patrick, it was first blue. It eventually changed, for various reasons, probably because of being used in various Irish flags and how green is associated with Ireland itself. Patrick worked in Ireland for 30 years. Afterwards, he retired and then died on March 17th, in AD 461. There wasn't a canonization process when Patrick died. That didn't come up until the 12th century. He would have been declared a saint by acclamation, and his sainthood approved by a local bishop soon after he died. St. Patrick's Day was originally a Catholic holiday, and still is, but has also evolved into a secular holiday, being celebrated by non-Irish, non-Catholics, and ironically enough, even atheists. Today, when people think of St. Patrick, they imagine a leprechaun in a green jacket, hat, pipe, clover, and a pot of gold. Not a man who devoted 30 years of his life to teaching and helping the Irish. 
Hopefully you now know a little more about the history of St. Patrick. Hello, my name is Sophia Spanagol from the Hopeless Cause podcast with your Sophie segment. And today I would like to talk with, to you about St. Corona. St. Corona was believed to have been a secret Christian. She was a martyr along with St. Victor, who we think have was killed with her. She is the patron saint of plagues. Coincidence, I think not. And her place is, of martyrdom is uncertain, but assumed to have been in Syria. Many miracles come from her intercession, and let's hope there are many more in the future. Did you know that Rapunzel survived a quarantine for most of her life? It's true, so having learned this, I googled Rapunzel, and do you know what her kingdom is called? Drum roll, please! Corona! In all seriousness, though, you should really be taking this time to pray for all families and those with the coronavirus. This would be a great time to strengthen your faith. Au revoir! The Gospel of John As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sin. It is so that the works of God may be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in this world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Salam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Someone said, It is. But the other said, No, it just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He replied, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Salam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the one who was blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on the Sabbath. So that the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said, He put clay on my eyes, and I wash, and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the blind man, What do you have to say about him, since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. They asked him, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered, We do not. We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know the one who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said because they were afraid of the Jews. They have already agreed that anybody who acknowledged him as the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, He is of age. Question him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that I was blind and now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I already told you and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? They ridiculed him and said, You are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, This is what's so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but one who is devout and does the will listens to him. It is unheard that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, You were already born into total, totally into sin. 
and now you are trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus had heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I have came into this world for judgment, for those who do not see might see, and for those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, Surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said, If you are blind, then you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sins remain. How can we see with eyes of faith? This gospel opens up with Jesus encountering a blind man. People often confuse the concept of suffering with living sinful lives. Even in our times today, people confuse this. I remember a young girl many years ago coming to youth group and she was told, your diabetes is caused because of the sins of your father. That's not how suffering works. Suffering is part of God's divine plan, which will ultimately bring glory through your life, not curses. Embracing your cross is a, is a tough one, especially when it's our cross. I've oftentimes told youth, your suffering that you endure and how you get through it, someday you're going to be able to help somebody. You're going to be able to look at them and say, I know your pain, I know what you went through, and there is hope. This concept is very important to understand when it comes to suffering. Pay attention to how Jesus performs a miracle. He proclaims during the time, I am the light of the world, while anointing the man's eyes, and then commanding him to go and wash. This is very connected to Jesus' Jewish roots. Jesus touches the man. Touch is so important when it comes to ministry. Sometimes people just need a hug. Well, I know it's going to be okay. We have to find new ways to touch people during these troubled times. New ways to reach people's heart through ministries like this and podcasts and deep devotions and family prayer. I urge you to find new ways for ministry. Ministries that touch your heart in your family homes and with each other. It also connects the Old Testament. We see God creating Adam out of spit and clay. Jesus is also echoing this through this miracle. Let me ask you. What part of your life needs healing right now? Ask Jesus to heal you and your faith will save you. Allow God to transform the way we see the world with eyes of faith. Sometimes a, a new perspective is important. You are all in my prayers during these times. Thank you for joining us this week. Please join us this Sunday from 7 to 8 for our virtual youth group. We've teamed up with Blaze Ministries, Next Level Ministry, and Y Disciple to create this uh, weekly youth group. Uh, already 3,000 youth have signed up for this. A big thanks to the diocese who showed us as great resource. Also, if you're looking for something different, please follow Encounter Mercy po Podcast. My friend Vince and Father Andy do an amazing job. Join us also every day for Mass. Father Des here at St. Jude does Mass virtually right from the St. Jude website, or you can join us on our Facebook. Saturdays at 4.30, Sundays at 7.30, 9 and 10, Tuesdays at 6.30, and every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 8 a.m. Pay attention to more content coming from Michael DeSanctis, Sarah Comey, and Jordan as we continue to try to reach out to everyone in this time of need. God bless you, and have a wonderful week.